just for the people that are joining remotely, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Perfect. So I was just saying to uh, go to this link and register to the NVIDIA Developer Program in order to be able to have access to our notebooks and uh, being able to execute the notebooks while we are presenting them during the session. Everyone has access to the link? I shared the link, Sarah, in the chat. Oh, perfect. Thank yeah. you. For the developer.media.com login link. Yeah, they should be able to go to this link. Yes. Oh, sorry. So yeah, let me uh, uh, say it again. So the NVIDIA Developer Program is a link where you can create an account. And once you have an account there, you can uh, um, attend to the events of the Rexis tutorial. We will provide you a code uh, uh, in a couple of minutes. And with this code, you can have access to the notebooks we are going to show. So you can execute at the same time the sales of the notebook and uh, follow in parallel there. Rune, I shared the link in uh, the Zoom chat so we can have access to it from the Zoom chat as well. Yeah, so the Zoom link, you can have access uh, to it from the Rexis Hub. If you just click on the Join button from the tutorial type, yeah, section in the Rexis Hub, you can be able to uh, get the Zoom link. So maybe let's uh, just start by um, introducing our presenters for today. So today we will have uh, four presenters for this session and uh, we will have uh, Ivan Aldrich, which is the, who is the manager of the NVIDIA Merlin team. Ivan has a PhD degree from the University of British Columbia in electrical and computer engineering. Um, we also have Renee Eich, a senior data scientist from the NVIDIA Merlin team. And Renee has a PhD in energy and power systems engineering from the French engineering school, Central Sibelet. We also have Benedict Schiffer, which is, uh, who is uh, a deep learning engineer from the NVIDIA Marine team. Uh, Benedict has a master in data science from Columbia University. And finally, uh, myself, Sarah Abib, uh, I'm a, a research scientist 
at NVIDIA Marine Team, and I had a PhD degree from the Institut Polytechnique de Paris. We also have uh, uh, our great TA that will assist you during the session to answer your question and also address any issue you have. So we have Gabriel Moreira, a senior research scientist, and we also have Mark and Oliver, senior uh, machine learning engineering engineers. They will be uh, joining the session remotely, so you can post your questions in the Zoom chat, and they will do their best to answer uh, to answer your questions. We also have Ben Fredrickson, uh, the principal engineering of the Nvidia Marine team, and he will be joining us in the yeah, in person uh, he, uh, we, uh, together with uh, Ivan Aldrich. So last but not least, I would like to thank the NVIDIA Marine team and also the DLI team for uh, their help and their support to prepare this tutorial. And also thank the, all the NVIDIA Marine team engineering for building the marine framework uh, that we will use to uh, show you all the notebooks of this session. So I will hand it to Runai. She will be uh, doing the first presentation. Please, Runai, take it. I, let me stop sharing. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes. Yeah, OK, perfect. All right, then. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining training and deploying multi-stage commander systems with Merlin and on tutorial session. I just want to check just quickly that uh, someone can say yes in the chat. The, our attendees attending virtually, can they see my slides and they can hear me well? I think they say yes. All right. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much for confirming that. And Sarah, thanks for this nice introduction. And I would like to welcome everyone again. Thanks for joining the session. Sarah already gave you the first instructions about this preparing for the hands-on tutorial. So if you didn't create an NVIDIA developer program account, we shared the link uh, uh, in the chat. And also you can see that it's here. This is the link and developer.nvidia.com um, uh, slash login. So let me start the slide show uh, during the slide show i won't be able to see your i think comments uh, if i'm not wrong i'm not super familiar with the zoom but yeah so uh it is loading let's see it takes a little bit time to load right i already presented our tas we already thanked to our teams and there's a big team behind uh, this of course the media morning team and also thanks to the deep learning institute team for uh letting us to uh, prepare this tutorial and uh, bring to you uh, today's agenda. Uh, so I will do like a 25 minutes presentation and uh, I would like to uh, do introduction training in deploying multi-stage commander systems first and I will hand it over to Sarah. Sarah is going to walk you through the section one and section two of the hands on lab and then after a short break Benedict is going to take it over and he's going to uh, walk you through the section three and four and then finally uh, our uh, media Merlin team engineering manager even Aldrich will do the conclusion remarks and we will continue to Q&A and even after the session I think we will be able to answer your questions over the zoom. All right then, so this is the important part. I assume Sarah, Benedict can share or Oliver can, uh, Gabriel, they're all, all here with us. Uh, um, and they can share this event code and the link. So you need to just go to this uh, courses at nvidia.com uh, slash GLI dash event link to and enter this event code. I assume you already have an account. If don't, don't worry, you can still create an account. And if you have an account, just sign in if they ask you to sign in. And then you will see the course page and there should be a start course link there, a tab you can, uh, or like a button, just click on the button and then it will take you to this page and there should be a start button. Uh, if you scroll down, when you click on the start, it will take a couple of minutes. It's okay, don't worry. I will be, the, be doing the presentation. So it will start the GPU instance and you will, so we will have access to uh, Jupyter Lab. And then once you, it starts saying launch, just click the launch and wait for Sarah that she will uh, walk you through the notebooks and she will, of course, explain the content of this um, tutorial. So 
uh, this is a recommender systems uh, conference. Everyone is familiar with what is the recommender system, but it's not going to hurt to give you a little bit introduction again to emphasize if this importance, right? Uh, so recommender systems, we know it's the uh, the it's the personalization of online services, and it is part of our daily lives from digital content to e-commerce to social media to digital uh, advertising. So it's basically everywhere. And we are talking about billion, billion dollars of industry and even a small improvement in for certain companies, small improvement in the, their uh, their um, success metrics can result in like billion or hundred billions of dollars. So that's such uh, a big amount, actually. And um, although it's very critical for every industry, it doesn't have to be a big company. It can be small, right, medium scale, large scale, but it's very critical recommender systems because we would like to generate personalized, relevant items to the users, right? That's the goal. Of course, unbiased, uh, want to provide unbiased, relevant, personalized recommendation, etc. So there are many metrics we, we, we might want to consider for sure, but this is a complex pipeline. It is not easy. It is... Uh, it is complicated and it has multiple stages. It's not just like train one simple model, deploy this simple model, voila, that's done. It's not really like that. Unfortunately, it is compli more complicated than that. So when we observe the industrial, uh, actual industrial settings and industrial use cases and real world context, we saw that it's actually more than that. It has multiple stages and we, we actually created this four stage pipeline and uh, uh, that has retrieval, filtering, scoring, and ordering. I mean, we didn't create, but just we, we, we are bringing into your attention as a diagram for sure. And this is what is really happening in the in the in the uh, in, in the wild. So it started the retrieval uh, step, which uh, retrieval uh, is aiming to generate uh, a certain number of candidates from this large uh, item corpus because it's not really feasible. It's not really scalable to score millions, hundred millions, sometimes billions of items, right? So we generate a small set of uh, candidates, uh, and then after applying some candidate retrieval uh, model, and then from there we move on. And the second stage will be filtering, so we can remove some unwanted or invalid candidates from this set that we already generated at the first stage. And the third step will be uh, uh, applying a scoring model. So we already have a scoring model, we train the scoring model, and then we now use this scoring model, or you can name it ranking model, to be able to rank, give us uh, like a, a significance or a re relevant score to this uh, subset coming from the filtering stage, whatever remained after the filtering stage. And the final stage, ordering, is what you actually apply your business logic. And you might want to add some diversity or want to reorder based on some certain uh, logic that you have, et cetera. So this is a, this is the like the overall high level maybe picture that we can summarize, and we will talk about how Nvidia Merlin. First of all, we will talk what is Nvidia Merlin. Then we will talk about how Nvidia Merlin is really addressing this complex pipeline and trying to make the life easier for Rexus practitioners. So some examples for these four stage recommender systems. Uh, we don't have time to go over all of it, but let's take the social media example. For example, we might want to find a new post in the retrieval stage in users network so we can get um, a subset candidate uh, of new posts and in the second stage maybe we would like to remove posts from this set that we already created posts from uh, blocked and muted users so the user doesn't want to see this post and there is no really uh, value that to show this to the user because users, users are already blocked them or muted them etc and then we score them, whatever remain after filtering stage, we add some likelihood to them, right? That user will interact with every post. And then maybe at the final stage, we might still consider reordering, doing some re-ranking and changing the order that adjust posts from different authors, right? So these are all actually happening things uh, in the industrial setting. Uh, so that's not like something uh, be made up. <laughs> it is there. People use it, etc. Uh, so we can see the examples in uh, different use cases. So how Merlin is handling this? So what is Merlin? Uh, Merlin framework actually is an open source framework. It is designed for scalable, uh, accelerated uh, uh, recommender systems and GPU accelerated recommender systems, and it is trying to help 
uh, users, access practitioners, uh, deep learning engineers, machine learning engineers, data scientists to accelerate and scale this end-to-end -end pipeline, right? Easily. And so Merlin supports all steps of recommended systems from ETL to deployment. Uh, and it, it is continuously uh, under uh, development. So it's, uh, it's I mean, we develop Merlin. Merlin has tools, components, to libraries, methods to help us. And it has different libraries that we will, I will walk you through. Uh, but so, of course, uh, I mean, this is an open source uh, library and we continue to develop the library. We add new features all, each time. And of course, we would like to support community, whatever they need, whatever their feature requests are. So uh, yeah, that's, that's Merlin. So it is goal, one of the goals is to provide high level APIs. And uh, it is end to end design enables complex workflows with only a few lines of code. This is one of the goals that we would like to achieve. We would like to uh, people to avoid this um, writing hundreds of hundreds of lines of like boilerplate code, like struggling, especially for those who are new to Rexis domain. Maybe uh, they would like to uh, just uh, get to start easily, understand what is going on, etc. And uh, of course, scaling is one of the features of Merlin. It, it provides uh, GPU acceleration. It has it is on um, optimized data loaders, and it is goal to process really large data sets, like terabytes, hundred terabytes of data sets, and it can run on uh, GPU, single GPU, multi GPU, uh, multi node on multi node GPU systems as well as uh, on CPU as well. So. Merlin's benefits at, at different steps of recommender systems can be divided in three sections, maybe. Uh, one is the model development evaluation. So what we really want as a data scientist, what I would want as a uh, deep, learning, deep learning engineer or machine learning engineer, what you would want. So we would like to build models, recommender models with high accuracy, right? But we don't really want to spend like uh, long, 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 long hours, days, and like uh, like maybe months, like, uh, and uh, of course, if it is required, we would, but if there is a way to accelerate that pipeline, we would appreciate that, right? So Merlin is providing this accelerating pipeline feature. So it is helping the community for fast experimentation cycle. We will talk about that, how. This is one of the goals. Like well, Merlin has a lot of goals, and that's one of the goals. Like we want people to actually uh, accelerate this from ETL to model uh, uh, training and offline evaluation pipeline. We want people to make it uh, much faster so that they can experiment more, right? And we will talk about this how. So Merlin also has libraries, as I mentioned, that uh, it is providing uh, implementation of common, common architectures, loss functions. It provides some negative sampling strategies. It provides us to be able to do different prediction tasks like uh, retrieval task, uh, ranking tasks, and um, uh, so uh, multi-learning tasks, etc. When it comes to deployment, what we want, we want to deploy be able to deploy new models into production systems. Maybe this is the most challenging part. Uh, of course, it's open to discussion, but maybe deployment is the most challenging part. It requires significant engineering of the machine learning pipeline. So deploying new, we should be able to, and we want to be able to deploy new models into production systems easily uh, without uh, too much challenge. So Merlin goal is again to, to provide simple APIs to push uh, train models to production systems easily. And of course, it wants to also not only deploy the models, train models, it wants to also integrate the ETL pipeline to this, um, uh, this train model pipeline too. So deploy as an ensemble, et cetera. And um, so I'm not gonna talk about the last part, but Merlin model also, uh, Merlin, Merlin is also aiming to integrate and connect with external tools as well. So we talk about this uh, multi-stage recommender system pipelines. I will show you a more complex uh, diagram uh, in a bit. And you can see that uh, it has a lot of components. So Merlin wants to also use the other external tools out there and integrate them easily. So help users to integrate them easily that they can deploy their models. All right then, so let's move on. And let's talk about the first part, how Merlin is really helping us to accelerate this first uh, stage model de uh, development part, right, and evaluation. So Merlin tries to enable quick experimentation cycles for us to find high accuracy models. And 
we know this cycle. This is like a very, uh, maybe uh, uh, it's an abstraction of this complex pipeline, right? From uh, taking the data, cleaning the data, preparing the features and feeding the features to model and training model and doing some offline evaluation and maybe doing this over and over until we find this good set of features and the model that gives us the accuracy that we wanted, et cetera, after our offline evaluation. So this is kind of cycle over and over we go over. So, and uh, it will be nice to, uh, somehow uh, something that can help us to reduce this, uh, actually make this seamlessly integrated first and help us to reduce the, 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 the maybe some, I will say, uh, chores or like uh, some cumbersome uh, processes that we are doing if there is a way. So Merlin is actually doing this uh, with some uh, functionality uh, by integrating the schema files, but we will talk about that. Let's talk about this uh, before. When we say recommender systems with deep learning, that doesn't mean Merlin is only supporting deep learning models, it is also supporting conventional techniques as well, and or some boosted tree algorithms. So let's talk about the recommender system with deep learning a little bit. And we know that we have an example data set like that in a tabular form, and we might have uh, both categorical and continuous features, mostly Generally, we have the categorical features because we have the item IDs, right user IDs, etc. And we, in our model, we need to process these categorical features and the numerical features as well, uh, and we need to feed them in a way to our model. So for the categorical features, we have these embedding layers that is uh, creating dense representation of the categorical features. And then after we do some pre-processing on the numerical features, we might want to concat them, right, to be able to feed them to the other layers. And then we finish the network by the uh, by connecting our layers to a prediction head based on the task that we would like to do so this is like an overall very simplified uh, uh, the like the summary of a recommender system with a deep learning right of course an architecture doesn't have to be that simple it can be very complex for example if you look at the look at the literature there were some very famous uh, architectures have been already proposed and they have been already adopted by uh, some practitioners, like Facebook proposed the LRM, uh, and Google has its all deep cross network. YouTube has its uh, DNN models, and each of them has their mechanism to handle the categorical features through an embedding layer and also leverage the interactions between the features. Uh, they can have some dot in, dot product interaction layer or some cross layers, etc. Even in some cases, you will should be able to feed the sequential features like in the YouTube DNN case and YouTube DNN even going one further away, one step away, sorry. Um, it is uh, letting us to able to uh, apply two stage recommender system, which has the candidate generation part and the ranking part, right? So why I'm talking about these architectures, these architectures are the architectures that have been, as I said, adopted by the literature and Merlin models is also uh, providing simple APIs for each of them that the, someone can take it and use it right away. We will talk about that. Let's go back to close interaction, right? So maybe one of the models you would like to train is, uh, so the model you would like to train is one of them, right? It could be DLRM, DCN, YouTube, TNN, or could be wide and deep, or the model that you would like to customize and build. Doesn't have to be any of them. But Merlin model simplifies this, this pipeline from pitch ranging to model training and evaluation simplify the dependency by uh, by providing a schema file. So we have schema files coming from the feature engineering step and which connects feature engineering and model training. So this schema files has the relevant information, that required information that a model can take and consume to build the layers on top of it. So we will see what is a schema file, of course, in the hands-on live uh, session. But uh, it can be a proto file, a proto text file, it can be a JSON file, which has the uh, information, for example, what is the cardinality? Uh, and for example, what is the minimum and maximum value? Uh, and the tags, the tags are very important. It's a categorical feature, it's a list item, it's an item ID, it's a user ID, etc. So it has all the necessary features that, sorry, necessary information that we can leverage in the model modeling phase. All right then. Um, it has schema files provide the close interaction between the MV tabular library, which is our feature engineering library. I'm going to talk about it and the modeling phase. So it can be any other, any modeling library, but today we will talk about the Merlin models because uh, we are not going to do sequential 
session based recommendation using the transformers that will be transformers for REC, or we will not use huge CTR for today, but we will use the Merlin models to build the recommender models. And we will show you the seamless integration between feature engineering and Merlin models. MV Tabular is Merlin's uh, feature engineering and pre processing library designed to quickly and easily manipulate terabytes of uh, tabular data. Um, and it is actually using the Merlin di uh, direct acyclic graph API. So that's the same thing that Merlin Systems is using. I'm going to talk uh, uh, in a bit. You can run feature engineering and pre-processing uh, pipelines with MV Tabular on both GPU and CPU. And we really see significant, uh, significant uh, acceleration with uh, uh, MV Tabular. So uh, uh, we like we also use it for certain cases, right? And and uh, for, so we can see that it can handle really terabytes of scales of data and it's really it is really fast so and i'm not going to spend too much time of um, mv tabular you will see it in the live uh, in the hands-on section but we have all the documents about mv tabular all the uh, examples please go ahead and look into them in the mv tabular library mv tabular has um, many operators for common uh, etl workflows and it can handle categorical, continuous uh, 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 features. And it has also operators that you can apply to both. For example, for the categorical, you want to apply Categorify op that to be able to encode these categorical features, right? Uh, there are many others. For the continuous, maybe you need to normalize the uh, continuous features, or you might want to do a log, uh, apply the log operation, etc. But there are also uh, there are also uh, some operators or feature engineering techniques that you can apply on both of them. Uh, for example, uh, with the Lambda app, you can actually uh, inject the user defined functions into your workflow, maybe Tabular workflow, etc. You can also create your own custom app, which we have examples in our uh, GitHub repo. Oops, sorry. Merlin models. Merlin models is uh, our uh, actually modeling library is for developed for high quality implementations from classical machine learning models to more advanced deep learning models, uh, both in TensorFlow and PyTorch. Currently, it has TensorFlow support and PyTorch support is in our roadmap. It's going to be available soon, and it has implementation. It provides implementation of common architectures. I will show you in a bit. What do I mean? Um, and it has uh, feature loss functions that's commonly used uh, by Rexus practitioners, and it supports different tasks, etc. The most important part of the Merlin model is that it is flexible building blocks to design our own custom uh, architecture. Sarah is going to walk you through what uh, I mean. And it, uh, it is using OGP optimized and Merlin data loaders with seamless integration with MV Tabular library. So it is supporting classical machine learning uh, techniques, it's supporting deep learning architectures, and it, has diff it supports different loss functions, et cetera, negative sampling techniques, and uh, it supports a lot of uh, ranking metrics, retrieval metrics, et cetera. Remember this, we, I showed you like a couple slides before Facebook DL, uh, DLRM uh, and uh, Google VC and YouTube DNN architectures. And so look at this couple lines of code. So we provided this uh, DLRM model, DCN model, YouTube, uh, YouTube DNN reachable model uh, actually functions. This functionality that you can just provide some arguments and with the schema you see here, this is a schema object I just talked about that. Uh, we can create a schema file and create a schema object and it carries a lot of information that the model can consume and then create all these uh, layers so that uh, with a couple lines of code you should be able to run a DLRM uh, DCN or YouTube DNM model. So next step we talk about feature engineering building models first iteration the first uh, part of the hands-on lab Sarah is going to walk you through and let's move on to the training and deploying multi-stage commander systems. Uh, in the first, uh, at, the, at the very first, I talk about this multi-stage commander system starting from candidate retrieval all the way to ordering. Uh, but it wasn't maybe always that uh, complex, or maybe it was always that complex, but like some uh, in some um, cases, uh, like practitioners only apply to stage commander systems, which has only candidate generation and ranking uh, steps. And the, with the candidate generation, uh, we generate the um, uh, items, the, the, we retrieve the items that um, we think we can score and then provide 
I present them or recommend them to the final uh, end users, right? So I don't want to talk about that much, but actually it, we move beyond that. It's unfortunately not really only two stage. We already talk about that. It is more complex than this. This is the more complex diagram that I showed you at the beginning. At the beginning, I showed you like a flow workflow, right? Starting from um, the candidate retrieval to the ordering, but look into that. This is more com much more complex because it has a lot of other components. It has two stages. One is the offline stage, one is the online stage. And the actual transaction between offline and uh, uh, online is not easy. And it has to be done carefully, seamlessly, right? And uh, this requires some also ML ops monitoring that the correct model is being deployed, not in a create model, etc. This is a compute intensive, and also a uh, development intensive workflow. It has other components, external components that I already mentioned you like uh, that MV, uh, that Merlin wants to integrate, also uh, connect with, for example, feature stores, feature storing, right? Also, or uh, building balloon filters to be able to do the filtering stage or um, the most important, one of the most important things in the candidate retrieval stage, uh, approximate nearest neighborhood, like some sort of uh, similarity search algorithms or tools can be integrated, which is required, etc. That's uh, why this is more, this is um, both compute intensive and development intensive. And of course, Merlin wants to uh, provide tools, provide uh, um, uh, methods, provide uh, classes and uh, and libraries that can help people in this end-to-end -end pipeline as well, right? So in the offline part, we already talk about how Merlin models can be used to develop, to develop for us to develop the recommender models and how we can use also MV Tabular for feature pre-processing, et cetera. Uh, but we can also provide more than that. So that's where the Merlin systems is coming to the scene. And Actually, Merlin Systems is designed and developed to provide a high-level API to deploy complex recommender uh, system pipelines on uh, the Triton inference server uh, as an ensemble. So think this, every step as a model, retrieval as a model, filtering as a model, scoring as a model, ordering as a model, and a part of the directed acyclic graph. Think this as a, each of them as a node maybe in a graph and then uh, Merlin systems uh, letting us to combine this and uh, export as an ensemble model and to be able to deploy it on Triton inference server. So you will see how, because Merlin system has operators for every stage, and uh, you will, uh, and then after we execute these operators, we should be able to generate the ensemble and export the ensemble and then deploy it on the Triton. All right then. Um, Triton and maybe a couple words about Triton. It's an inference uh, inference server. It's, it is developed to simplify the deployment uh, AI based models. It can be machine learning models. It can be deep learning models at scale in production. It is uh, a lot of features. We don't have time for this. Triton needs maybe its own uh, tutorial, but uh, it has different features like dynamic patching, et cetera. It, uh, it supports multiple frameworks with multiple backends like TensorFlow framework. Um, TensorFlow backend, PyTorch backend, and Onyx, etc. You can even do custom backends, Python backend, C++ backends, etc. So um, Triton supports both uh, deployment models on CPU and GPU. There are a lot of examples in the Triton GitHub repo as well. And when it comes to the how Merlin model, a Merlin system simplifying the, this complex pipeline, I already showed you this uh, multi-stage. Actually, it is reducing this complex ensemble pipeline to like 50 lines of code. And uh, we, we you will see that it is it is providing like uh, operators like like for example query feeds operator that is integrating with the feeds feature store or query face which is integrating with the face uh, uh, um, similar to search library etc. So by using these operators we are also able to uh, integrate the external tools as well. And that is it. Now we will move on to hands-on lab. I'm checking my timing that I uh, hope I'm not running too much behind, but okay, we will go on to hands-on lab. Let's talk about the data set before I actually hand this over to Sarah. In this hands-on lab, we are going to, this is training and 
uh, deploying multi-stage recommender systems tutorial. And for this tutorial, we have we used the publicly available e-commerce behavior data from multi-category store. Data set is also named as ZS46. It is available on Kaggle. And uh, the data actually has seven months of data from October 2019 to April 2020. And it has view card purchase events. It can be also uh, uh, like a remove from cart uh, event, but we actually simplified the data set a little bit before. And uh, what we did, we um, only considered the add to cart and purchase events. And we took the add to cart as a, a negative event and the purchase as a po positive event or negative interaction, positive interactions. And then um, after applying this type of uh, pre-preparation, pre-cleaning, uh, uh, we actually end up with like seven points something six million samples right after also doing some removing some repeated interactions this cleaning is available in our uh, repo i will send you the link after my presentation share the link so if you would like to see the first very first introduction so data preparation notebook please go there but we have already done this so you will start with this prepare 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 sorry prepare um parquet files all right and data has these raw features you can see here some of them we will uh, use some of them uh, actually we will uh, use to create more features you will see in our inevitable pipeline that's it uh yeah please go ahead i hope you already start the lab everything is ready at your end you can launch it uh, yeah that's all from my side sarah you can take it over i can stop sharing Thank you, Renee. Thank you for the great presentation. Thank so, you so much. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. So let's start the hands-on lab session. And let's just go to the link, the notebooks. So as I mentioned earlier, you need to uh, uh, go to the courses in Vidya and uh, tap the event code. Then you can have a button like the launch button where you can access to your notebook. You should have something like that, a Jupyter lab with four notebooks and a data di directory. And the first exercise will be about implementing common Rexis architectures using the marine models library. So uh, just to uh, give an overview of the objective of this exercise, as mentioned by Renai, in the marine framework is uh, built to support deploying large uh, recommender systems. And for that, we develop a different components for the different steps from the future engineering step to uh, the modeling and the deployment. Uh, at the, as a last step. So in this exercise, we will focus on the two first components, the future engineering using Invitabular library and model uh, definition using the marine models library. You can get access to more information about the libraries by following the link of either marine models or Invitabular. There you will have uh, various examples and just a quick question before uh, starting uh, the exercise. Does everyone have access to the lab and the notebooks? Yes, Doctor. Yeah, the URL is uh, if. Let's just recall the URL. I think uh, Runai or Benedict share it in the Zoom link. So it's the DLI uh, event. It's nvidia.courses slash DLI event. So we can go there and just uh, copy paste the code shared by Runai. Uh, then uh, you'll need to uh, start the lab. It will take some minutes if you didn't do it beforehand, but it's a matter of five minutes and then you will have access to the notebooks. For the people that don't have access to the lab, they can still go to under uh, our GitHub repo, NVIDIA Marine Publications, and there is a di directory called Rixis 22 tutorial. 
So there you can have access to the notebooks and follow in parallel in the mint while the lab is starting. So let me just... Just go back to the notebook and yeah, so the first exercise will be to build future engineering and prepare some input variables for our deep learning models. For that, we will use the e-commerce uh, data set. And as mentioned by uh, Renai, we will use the, all the data from October, 2019 to April, 2020. And we will filter only the add to cart and purchase events. We did some preliminary processing steps to fill the missing values and also to split the data into a train and validation set. And all these steps are within the data preparation notebook that will not be the focus of to, uh, today's session, but you can access it in um, the GitHub repo and get the information from there. So in terms of the future engineer step that we will be use, uh, using in this session, the, we will uh, mainly create uh, four main uh, variables. The first one is encoding the categorical vi variables to be able to provide them to a deep learning model. Then we will create some temporary futures from a timestamp column. We will also show you how to define a user uh, defined Lambda uh, function and use it together with the Invitabular library. Then we will also show you um, a target encoding technique that we used in uh, previous Rexis competitions and that shows uh, to be a really uh, perform performance technique to uh, encode the categorical features. Then we will also tag the input features and the target column so as to prepare some metadata information needed by the memory libraries to uh, set up the, the models. We will show you later how these tags are used in the model definition. So let's get started by importing the libraries we need for our lab. You can just, these are some warnings from TensorFlow, so please just ignore them. Uh, we will also fix the random seed so as to make sure we can all have the same results. And the first step will be to load the data we want to uh, use for the future engineering. So for that, we will use the Invitabular dataset object, which allow us to load the parquet files on GPU by chunk. And thanks to that, we can process a large data set that are not fit in one GPU uh, by processing chunk by chunk. And we can scale up to billions of row uh, for, the for the future engineering step. We can also have a quick look uh, of uh, the data set we are using. So you can see we have the user and the product IDs. We have the timestamp column and we have some additional information about the items such as the brand and the price. So the first step, as I mentioned, is encoding the categorical features. For that, we will use an operator from Invitabular called the Categorify. And uh, we are supporting the DAG representation, so we just need to specify the, co the column name we want to uh, provide to our operator. And we also uh, have a, a second step, which allow us to add some metadata information about our future. And as I will show you later, this metadata information is needed by the Marine Models Library to set up the, the model with the right parameters. We will do the same with the item ID. And here we will tag it as an item ID. Then we will also encode the categorical features related to the item. Please, if you have any question, just post it in the Zoom chat. And uh, we also have Ivan and Ben in the room that will help you uh, if you have any question or if you have any issue with the uh, notebooks. So if we go back here at this step, we encoded the categorical features. And the second step you want to show is to generate some temporal features from a timestamp. So for that, we have access to the Lambda operator uh, from Invitabur that allow us to uh, define a custom function we want to use. So here 
we are using a function to extract the day of the week and the hour of the day. We also want to uh, tag the timestamp as a time feature. So for that, we can use the add metadata operator that allow us to add some information about our feature, typically here to uh, tag it as a time one. And at the end, we just like group the weekday and our features and categorify them in order to be able to uh, use them as inputs of our deep learning architectures. So the third step is to show you how to define uh, a custom function. So for that, we will use as a uh, we will use as an example computing the relative price to the um, of a product ID to the average price. So as you can. Uh, no, like the, a product ID in the e-commerce can have different prices based on whether it's a, a sales period or not. And what we, we want to capture here is given an interaction at a given time, we want to compute the relative price of this uh, interaction item ID to the uh, average one. So first we start by defining the function we want to compute. Here, it, uh, the function will accept two parameters, the column related to the average price we want to use for our uh, computation, and then the data frame with the, that contains all the interactions. We uh, just specify an epsilon parameter to um, avoid a zero division, and all the logic can be defined here. So we access the price at a given time, and we just uh, compute its relative uh, value based uh, uh, with respect to the average price of the product. So the first step is to compute the to define the function. The second step is to prepare the price column. So we have a price column, but first we needed to we need to uh, uh, make sure that there is uh, no missing values. So we are just missing with a zero value. Then we are making sure that the price is normalized. For that, we use a log, uh, a log normalization with these two steps. In here, we are just making sure that the column is uh, of type float 32. And the final step, similar to what we did uh, earlier, is tagging the price as an item feature because this is needed for the modeling step. So we have our uh, function and we have the price column process. Now we can compute. Now we need to compute the average price. So for that, we will uh, use a, uh, an operator called join group by, and you can see this operator as two steps. The first one will uh, do a joint merge between the product ID column and the process price column. Then we are grouping by the product ID and computing the uh, the mean statistics. So now that we have all the needed parts to create our relative price uh, feature, we can uh, group it together inside this operation. So first we will need the column related to the average price as an input to our function. Then we will use the Lambda operator to, from in vitro to be able to uh, execute the custom function and just uh, uh, an argument needed by lambda operator uh, is dependency, where we can specify the columns that will be called within our function. So you can see in our function, we are calling the price column. That's why we needed to uh, specify the price uh, as a dependency here. The remaining uh, operators is just making sure the type is float 32. We can also uh, give a name to the generated feature and finally uh, add the necessary metadata in order to be able to use it uh, for the model definition. So here the relative price will be a continuous feature and also an item feature. You can see that we can either use the standard tags defined in the Merlin uh, library, but we can also specify the tag uh, as a string representation. So the final feature engineer step you want to do is uh, target encoding which is uh, um, uh, a way of encoding the categorical features that will uh, leverage information from the label column. Uh, for the sake of the time, I won't give uh, much details about the target encoding uh, technique, but you can check our blog post where you can have uh, all the information and the, the explanation behind uh, using this uh, target encoding technique in compositions. 
So the first step is to uh, select the categorical features we want to encode. So here we are selecting the user ID, the brand. Yeah. Uh, have you access to the DLA uh, event platform or? Uh, yeah, I think even can help you with that. And also there is the Zoom chat where we have our TS. They, they will also be able to help you if you have any issue with uh, connecting to the lab. Sorry about that. Ah, the GitHub repo, yeah, sure. So if you go under the NVIDIA Merlin GitHub page, you have a repo called publications. And once you are there, we have a directory tut called tutorial slash Rexis 22 tutorial. If you click on it, you will have the list of the notebooks. The one I'm showing right now is the notebook number two, implementing Rexis architectures, which is this one. So maybe let's give just two minutes for everyone to be able to have access either to the GitHub repo or the DLI platform before resuming the, the lab.
So I hope everyone can have access either to the DLI lab or the GitHub repo where you can like follow in parallel. Sorry about that. I think we have also a limited capacity of the DLI lab. So we apologize for this inconvenience, but you can still follow um, the, the, we have the notebook with the same steps in our GitHub repo. So if I got back to the future engineering step, we were at the step where um, we generated the relative price using a custom uh, function. And we were about to generate uh, encoded categorical variables using the target encoding uh, operator. For that, we uh, just select the features we want to encode. Here it's the user ID and some item features. And then we also select the label column we want to use for the target encoding. So you can see here, we uh, uh, in the left side, we have the categorical features, and then we feed them to a target encoding operator where we specify the label column. From the generated features, we want to normalize them in order to be able to use them for deep learning. And for that, we are just applying the normalizer. They can still follow in the screen. So once we normalize, we make sure we tag the features as item features and make sure their uh, uh, their type is flow thirty two. The final step is uh, making sure we can save the raw values of the user ID and the item ID. And this is a step that is needed for the deployment stage. So Benedict can show you later how uh, these uh, raw features are used for sending a request to the inference uh, server. So at this point, we defined the different operators and the features we want to generate. This is a lazy definition, nothing was computed yet. And the first step before doing the computation is to define the whole graph where we will uh, uh, combine all the operation we uh, define. So the, the operation from encoding the user ID until uh, saving the raw features and the target. Once we have our operational graph, we can provide it to an invit tabular workflow, which is the class manager for fitting and transforming the data. So at this cell, this is the moment where we are actually uh, reading the data and computing the, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, feature we defined earlier. So first step is fitting the workflow using only the train data set. And then from the fitted workflow, we can transform the train data set and the validation one and save them into parquet files under the specified uh, directory. You can see that the execution is pretty fast. It took us nine seconds to fit the whole data set and also to transform uh, the validation and the train one. We can also save the workflow. By saving the workflow, we will uh, be able to save the schema file where we will store all the information related to the tagging and also the type of features, whether they are categorical or continuous. And this is important for the marine uh, models library that we will show you right after this section. So now we have our uh, future engineering process using uh, Invitabular, and we also generate the process data with the, the train and the, for the chain and the validation. Now we can move to uh, building the uh, Rexis architectures using the marine models library. If you can give me just one second uh, to plug in my computer, because it seems that the battery is very low. Sorry about that. So yeah, at this stage we will uh, 
So at this stage, we will define the, uh, the different Rexis architectures we want to use and uh, get some results uh, using the uh, pre-processed data set we just created. So first we load the data set, the train and the valid using the data set object that will allow us to load the data on GPU into chain. Then we will also specify the schema we want to use for the model definition. So for that, we will uh, just get the schema from the train data and make sure we remove the raw features and the timestamp because these features are, are not gonna be used for the model definition. To have a quick look of the schema, so you can see we have the list of all the features we generated, such as the relative price, the target encoding features one, but also the encoded uh, original features. We have tags that allow us to, uh, to differentiate between the categorical and continuous features also between the user and item ones. And at the end, we can see that we also have some uh, additional information about the categorical features, such as the cardinality and also uh, the optimal dimension uh, for the embedding table uh, based on the cardinality of each uh, feature. just execute these two steps and then here we are just selecting the target column so as we can uh, use it for defining the prediction task. So the first architecture we will uh, uh, try to implement is the DLRM model which is a deep learning architecture uh, proposed by uh, Facebook research team in 2019 and uh, the architecture consists of three main steps. So we have the input representation block where the categorical are represented using embedding tables and numerical features are projected into the same uh, dimension space as the, as the categorical one using an MAP layer. Then the vectors from the input representation are fed to a pairwise interaction block. As uh, its, na its name shows, it, the block try to learn some pairwise interactions between the input features. And the output of this pairwise interaction will be then concatenated with the um, continuous representation we have from the MLP. So you can visualize that as a skip connection where continuous are fed to the pairwise interaction, but also uh, concatenated uh, with the output of this block. And the results of this concatenation will just be fed to a top MLP layer and then uh, uh, binary classification layer will be applied to get the final score. So how it looks like in terms of Merrill models. Uh, so it, in Merrill models, we have a function called DLRM model that allow us to instantiate the DLRM architecture in one liner. And the arguments are as follows. So we have first the schema, which is the table I show you previously, where we have all the information about the different input features. And this schema will be used by the DLRM model to make sure the categorical features are represented by embedding tables uh, and the continuous one are fed to the MLP layer. Then we just specify the dimension we want to use for representing our features, our categorical features. The button block is the one used for projecting the continuous. We just need to make sure that the final layer is having the same dimension as the embedding tables. And then we have the top block that will be applied after the pairwise interaction to prepare the final hidden state that will be provided to the binary classification task. Here we have the binary classification task class from Merrill models. And as you can see, we just need to provide the name of the target column and the binary task will make sure the layer is correctly set with the right uh, parameters. So the uh, Merrill models was built on top of Keras so the model class we have here is a subclass of the Keras and we can have access to all the methods provided by Keras such as compiling the model by specifying an optimizer, the, the, uh, whether to run the model as a graph or as an eager mode. And also we can use the classic Keras matrix to compute the performance. Then we can call the model.fit by specifying the train and the validation data here we are providing a data set, not a data loader. So we need to specify the batch size and the fit will uh, define the data loader under the hood with the correct batch size. 
let me just execute these two cells to make sure the training is launched. So it will take some time. And um, the objective of this notebook was to show you how to define the architectures. So we didn't uh, focus much on uh, optimizing the scores. So please uh, don't uh, uh, pay attention to the scores you are getting from this iteration because it was not the focus of this lab. So the second architecture we wanted to show you is the DCN model. And uh, a quick overview of the DCN model, the, the main uh, uh, contribution was the uh, introduction of the cross layer that aims to learn some explicit features, uh, features interactions between the inputs, and then feed these explicit features to a deep network in order to uh, learn additional implicit uh, features from it. So they are uh, suggesting two types of architectures. The st stacked one, where uh, we first apply the cross layer on the input, and then the output of these explicit interactions will be fed to a deep network. Uh, the second architecture is the parallel one, where we have two towers, one with the cross layer that learns the explicit interactions, and the other tower with a deep network for the implicit ones. The result of these two towers are concatenated and then fed to the prediction layer. In this lab, we will use the stacked one and similar to the DRM model, you can see that in many models, we already have a DCL model function where we just need to provide the schema in order to uh, initialize the input layers with the right parameters. We have also a parameter called depth that will allow us to control how uh, the number of the cross layers we want to apply in a series. And then we have the deep uh, block for the deep network architecture. Similar to, to the previous uh, uh, DLR model, we will use the binary classification task uh, for our use case. And same, we, just, we can uh, just use the compile and the feed method from Keras. So at this step, we showed how uh, we can define the DCN and the DLRM with one liner of code. And before moving to the other architectures, we just want to mention that uh, with my models, you can also do hyperparameter tuning and the functions for DSCN or DLRM can accept uh, a large number of parameters. So here we can imagine that we want to control the dimension of our input features. And for that, we have a class in marine models called the embedding option, where uh, we can uh, control different parameters such as the dimension of the embedding, but also the regularization term that we can add to our embedding table. For the, uh, for the DCN model, as I mentioned earlier, we have the depth parameter that we can control. And also for the deep block, the deep block is an MLP layer where we can define the number of an, uh, hidden dimension we want for each layer in the MLP network. But we also have access to the activation parameter that allow us to specify the activation we want to use. And similar to the embedding uh, tables, we also have access to the regularization term for the weights and the values. We also have access to the dropout parameter that allow us to uh, uh, avoid overfitting during training by randomly deactivating some units from the network and make sure that the network doesn't get adapted to specific uh, training um, examples. So in terms of how the code looks like, you can see in this first cell for the embedding options, we will start by getting the name of the item ID column and the user ID column from the schema. For that, we have some mutual function in the schema such as selecting by tag. So here, typically what we want is to select by the tag item ID to be able to access the item ID column and similar for the user ID. For this both the item ID and the column ID, we want to hard code the dimension to uh, 128. So for that, we just define a dictionary where we provide the name of the column you want to fix the dimension for and specify the dimension you want. Once we have the, dimension, the hardest coded dimensions for the columns we want to use, we can call the embedding option class 
where the first parameter will be the dictionary with the hard-coded dimension. For the remaining categorical features, we uh, uh, decided to keep inferring the optimal embedding size from the cardinality. And for that, we have an option uh, inside the embedding options, which is infer embedding size equal to true. What will be uh, what this option will do is go over the schema file, get the cardinality of the given feature, and just um, uh, compute the optimal embedding size from the from its cardinality. We also, as mentioned, have the access to the regularization parameter. So this is the part of the input block. In terms of the DCN model, we can control the architecture of the deep block, which is, as I said, an MLP uh, network. We can define the dimensions, the activation uh, function we want to use, the dropout parameters, and also the regularization uh, for the weights and the bytes. Then we just have to space it to provide the embedding options for our input features. So by executing that, we can like get the model with the new parameters and we just uh, can call another iteration of the training to compare with the previous uh, uh, DCN architecture. So moving forward because of uh, the time constraints. The final architecture we want to present is the XGBoost, which is a machine learning algorithm that shows uh, a, a great improvement. And even like in some competitions and some use case, XGBoost outperforms the deep learning architectures. So that's why we wanted to include it in, the, uh, in our million models library and also in this lab. So XGBoost is, based, is a, a scalable version of the gradient boosted algorithm, which is which can be seen as a random forest where we are trying to combine an ensemble of weak learners, where, which are uh, decision trees. But instead of combining them in a random fashion, we are using a gradient descent algorithm with uh, an objective function to minimize in order to uh, get the right weights for combining these weak learners. So to be able to uh, ensure uh, uh, an efficient training. We are using the Dask data frame that allows us to fit a uh, large data set in uh, the GPU memory by loading the data by chunk. And to avoid the complex uh, steps of setting up the local task cluster, we just created a distributed manager that you can use for training the XGBoost. So the step is in, uh, in, uh, importing the XGBoost and the distributed manager, then specifying the parameters for the booster algorithm and also the training parameters. Then we just call the distributed manager to set up the local cluster. And inside, we define the model called the fit and the evaluation. So you can see the iterations are pretty fast and we can get the final metric afterward. So in a quick summary, uh, we uh, went over how to do feature engineering using NVTabular library. And we also showed how we can use the schema from the NV, uh, provided by the NVTabular workflow to uh, define the model within the marine models library. Before moving to the next notebook, we just need to execute this cell to make sure that the GPU memory is freed and that we can move to um, the, using the second uh, notebook. So uh, you can uh, uh, still use the chat if, uh, if yeah, the first exercise was quick, sorry, we have a time constraint. So please don't hesitate to, uh, put, uh, to post your questions uh, in Zoom, and our TAs will be more than happy to, to answer them. So in the previous exercise, we went over custom architectures like DLRM or DCN. And in this notebook, we wanted to uh, show how we can customize our
You know why? No, I think the, are you able to hear me and see the screen in the, in Zoom? Perfect. So it's just the. Uh, so we. All right. There is just an issue with the screen sharing in the in room presentation. I feel like this is more complicated than it should be. <clears throat> this I think it's connected to the yeah to the projector. It's just Yes, I think so. Yeah. Sorry about that. We just have an issue with the projector. So I think we can resume the session. And I. Yes. Yeah, it seems working. So I think we can resume the session. Sure. Yeah. So as I was saying, like in the first notebook, we went over some common Rexis architectures, but the question is how we can customize these architectures for our uh, specific need, either for the research or the data, the daily data science work. And for that, we uh, tried to build the marine models based on some low level bidding blocks to uh, offer enough flexibility for the user to customize either the input blocks the dense layers, the prediction task using one or multiple prediction tasks, for example, and also using some custom loss functions or metrics. So that's the objective of this exercise. It is to show you how, this, uh, how to use these uh, low level bidding blocks for uh, three main uh, uh, exercises. In the first one, we will try to implement the DLRM architecture from scratch. Then we, in the second exercise, we will uh, customize this DLRM by adding uh, a cross product transformation to our input block. This transformation was first proposed by the wide and deep architectures. Uh, and you can check their paper to get more information about this transformation. And in the second exercise, we will replace the pairwise uh, interaction block 
apply the cross layer from the DCN model. So let's get started by importing our libraries and fixing the random seed. We also need to load our data and specify the schema file we want to use for the model definition. So before deep diving in the code, we just wanted to give a, a, a quick introduction about uh, the uh, core building blocks of memory models. And the one, the core abstraction is what we call the block, which is um, instance or, or a subclass of the Keras layer that has some additional methods to allow you to easily connect and define custom architectures. In terms of the input feature blocks, we have the embeddings blocks that, is, uh, that controls how the embedding tables are created for the categorical features. And we have the continuous features for the continuous variables. We also uh, uh, implement some methods to connect blocks between them. So we have the connect, which will just uh, do a sequential um, uh, connection between the different blocks. And we also have specific uh, uh, function we call connect with shortcut, where we first apply the blocks sequentially, and then the output from this sequence of blocks will get connected to the input using a skip connection. So let's start with the first exercise, which is building the DLRM architecture from scratch. And as a quick recall, you can see the DLRM architecture as uh, six main steps. So first, we define an MLP layer to uh, represent the continuous features. Then we have the embeddings layer for the categorical ones. The output from these two blocks will be concatenated and fed to the pairwise interaction block. And the output from this pairwise interaction will get connected again to the MLP layer for of the continuous features. And the final result will be fed to a top MLP and to the prediction layer. So before defining these six steps, let's just get a random batch from our data. And this batch, and this batch will be used to, to check the outputs for each um, step in uh, our um, definition of the DLRM architecture. So you can see the batch is, for, uh, uh, is a dictionary with tensors. The key is the name of the columns and the value is the related tensor. So let's start with the first iteration. Yes. Uh, so you can uh, check the link posted in the Zoom link to get access to the notebook, but I am afraid there is a uh, limited capacity to get access to the DLL lab. What we also have is the our GitHub repo, which is under the NVIDIA Mervin organization. The repo is called publication. And there you can have access to the same notebooks under the tutorial. Yeah, it's the same code. So you can follow in GitHub. Uh, the notebook I'm currently showing is the notebook three, which is customized marine models. Sure. Sure. So if we go back here, we have our batch of data, which is a dictionary of changes. And we can start with the first step, which is um, defining the continuous uh, features. For that, we will use the continuous feature block. And this block has a method called from schema that allows us to just provide the schema and the block under the hood will look for the continuous features and group them together. So if we execute this cell, you can see the output from the continuous block is just a filtering over the continuous variables we have, such as the price, the relative price, or the target encoded features. We want to be able to project them in the same dimension space as the categorical features. And for that, we will use an MLP layer where with the same dimension as we want to use for the embeddings. So here you can see from this button block, what we got is a representation vector of dimension 64 for all the conti our continuous inputs. We can move to the second step, which is defining the embedding tables for the categorical ones. And similar to the continuous block, we just need to provide the schema. 
with the categorical features and the, the dimension we want to, uh, to use for our categorical. The output would be a dictionary where each uh, uh, categorical feature is now represented with a hidden vector of a uh, dense vector of 64. Sorry, the output is very long. Yeah. So now we have our embedding representation and, and our continuous, and we want to concatenate them in one vector. So for that, we will use the what uh, we have in many models, and it's called the parallel block, where we can define different branch in parallel and apply them to the same input. So typically here, you can see the input is our raw features, and we will provide it to our DLRM input block, which is a parallel block that will apply bottom and EBD blocks in parallel and return as um, a dictionary with the, the vectors from the embeddings, but also the vectors from the bottom block. So at this step, we have our input block that takes it uh, as inputs the raw features and uh, outputs as the dictionary of all the tensors for categorical and continuous one. We can move to the third step, which is the pairwise interaction block step. There, we can recall, uh, it consists of three steps. We take the features from the continuous and the categorical and do a dot product interaction to get the pairwise interaction uh, representation. This pairwise interaction uh, uh, representation will be then concatenated with the MLP block, which in our case we call deep continuous. And this concatenated vector will then be fed to a dense top layer, MLP layer. So these three iterations I just presented can be done in the, within this line of code where we can use the connect with shortcut method that allow us first to apply the dot product interaction on the inputs we are getting from the parallel block, which are these features. Th then the output of this dot product interaction will be concatenated. So here we are specifying the aggregation with the bottom block, which is the continuous one. So that's why here the shortcut filter, we are just specifying the feature we want to use from our inputs in order to connect it with the output of the pairwise interaction. And we can also apply uh, this to our raw input to see that at the end, we just have a vector of dimension 100, which is the result of the pairwise interaction uh, concatenated with the continuous one. So the final step is to define the top MLP block. Here we decided to use three layers of uh, uh, for the MLP, but you can uh, uh, control the, the layers dimension you want to use. So yeah, at this stage, we have our DLRM body that takes the input features and uh, return us a hidden representation of these uh, features, taking into account the continuous features, the categorical ones, and also the pairwise interactions between them. We can move to the step where we want to define the task we want to um, use. So here typically is the binary task, and we just need to provide the schema to this task. Under the hood, the task will look for the binary target uh, tagged in our schema and use it as uh, the target for our output layer. Then here, we are just connecting the DLRM body to our prediction task in order to get the final uh, Keras model uh, that we will use for fitting and uh, evaluation. So that's it. We are uh, we at this step. We uh, created from scratch the architectures that was uh, instantiated behind the DLRM model function we have in our high-level API. And the second exercise here is uh, uh, trying to customize this DLRM block in order to add some uh, new ideas or some ideas from other um, architectures that shown to be uh, effective in the Rexis domain. And typically here, we want to add um, an additional feature to our input uh, block, 
which is a feature from resulting from the cross product transformation technique that was suggested by the wide and deep architecture. And typically, the main reason there is to be able to learn some explicit interactions about um, niche preference of the user that we have seen in the training data, and that the deep learning mo uh, models cannot capture because they are really rare or they are very specified to a given user. So that's why they use this cross product transformation and combine it with the deep network in order to be able to learn different aspects from the training data. So for the sake of simplicity in our use case, we are will just show a cross transformation between two categorical features, but you can imagine that we can um, generate different cross features for, for uh, two or even more categorical features based on the expertise of the data scientists and the doc and the domain knowledge. And for that, we have the hashed cross all class that allows you to define different uh, ways to cross the features between them by, ju by just mentioning the names of the features you want to cross. So to avoid rebuilding the DLRM body from scratch, in the Marine models, we have a class called DLRM block that allows you to exactly do what we just did in our first exercise, going over the input features and applying the pairwise interactions and the skip connection on top of it. So that's why in this second exercise, we will just see about that. Let's check. I think I need to free the memory. Sorry about that. I just need to re-execute the cells. So yeah, I was uh, saying that we can use the DLRM block to get exactly the DLRM body we defined from the first exercise. And what we need to, what we wanted to uh, add in this exercise is these additional inputs related to the uh, cross uh, product. So for that, we first need to define the cross schema, meaning the, the features that we want to uh, cr uh, cross in order to generate the cross product feature. And here we are, for our example, we are using the categorical zero and one. Then we can use hashed cross class from the Marion models that accepts this cross schema and also accept the number of pins. So here you can imagine, sorry, yeah. Why we need the number of pins, uh, it's mainly because of um, scalability. So we can imagine that if we have two very sparse categorical features, the cross product will explode and have a really large dimension. And in order to be to control the dimension of the cross product, we are just using a hashing trick that allows us to uh, make sure all the resulting features are within the number of pins. So typically there is a trade-off between uh, of the number of pins. If the number of pins is very small, we will lose information because there will be a lot of collisions. And if the number of pins is really large, we will lose uh, performance and scalability. So we can um, apply the cross features and see that the resulting is a one hot encoded future that encode the information about when the categorical zero and the categorical one co-occurred in a given interaction. So you can learn more about the hashed cross in the link we have mentioned in the notebook. And uh, just moving forward to uh, being on time, we can see that this, uh, at this part, we have our cross features and we want to generate a representation from these cross features. So typically what they do in uh, wide and deep is that they are using uh, a weighted SAM uh, that can be seen as a regression layer where we are just uh, learning weights that we are giving to each position in our uh, cross future uh, uh, cross future one hot encode value. And to be able to do that with Marine models, we just need to uh, define a MAP block with dimension one that will exactly do the sum for us, the weighted sum. So here you see the result is just one value for each uh, interaction. But you can imagine if you have multiple features, we will have uh, a multiple dimension vector at this step. So to be able to um, combine them, we will use the parallel block 
and the aggregation concatenate, uh, concatenation to be able to have one final vector with the white part related to the corset features and the DLRM part related to the DLRM interaction representation. Then similar to uh, the previous exercise, we just specify the binary classification task, wrap it inside a model class and then call the compile and update. So that was about customizing the input block and adding some uh, new features to it. The final exercise is about customizing the DLRM architecture in itself. So here, instead of using the pairwise interaction provided by uh, the DLRM paper, we wanted to use the cross layer from DCN and define a, a kind of a hybrid architecture between DCN and DLRM. So for that, we need to redefine our inputs. So uh, it's just a copy paste of the code to, shown in the first exercise, which goes over the continuous and the embedding features and merging them into one uh, dictionary with, with uh, all the features in it. And this is where uh, the customization is made. So here, instead of doing the skip connection and the, the, um, using the dot product interaction, we will use the cross layer from the DCN. For that, in Marion models, we have a class called crossblock that do exactly the computation defined in the DCN paper. So we will just need to connect the inputs to this cross layer to have an explicit feature interactions learned by the cross network. And this explicit feature interaction representation can be then provided to the bottom MLP layer, similar to what we have in DLRM, and connected to the binary classification to compute the final score. So similar, we have the model class that contain first um, uh, deep DLRM interaction, which is a mix between the inputs from the DLRM block and the cross um, layer from the DCN. Then we have the binary task, and we can call the compile and defeat. So I apologize if it was fast, but it, we ha unfortunately have a time constraint. But just to sum up what we have uh, learned so far from this uh, second notebook is that marine models is flexible enough and offers all the building blocks to build custom architectures. And uh, we also show how to first implement a known architecture from scratch, but also how to customize it with uh, new ideas or ideas from other architectures. So that was it for this uh, first lab where we went over the Invitabular and Marine Models Library. Uh, I think it's time for a break, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask us. We will have a break of 10 minutes and then Benedict will uh, take it over to present you how to build the multi-stage system and uh, how to deploy it uh, using the Triton Inference Server. Thank you.
So we are close to the end of the break. So we will continue with the second part in like a minute. Can everyone hear me like in the, for the virtual people on Zoom and the people in person and can see my uh, browser again? Okay. Hello? Hello, can you hear me better? Yes, we can. Perfect. Just one more minute that people um, get ready to continue the part and we can start them with the second part, uh, deploying, uh, actually building multi-stage recommender system with the special focus on deploying. We'll resume the session right now, Benedict is connected. The session. So, can everybody get back? Benedict, if we can give just two minutes for the in person attendees to get back to the room. Okay. Can you let me know when we can continue? Sure. Because yeah. I don't see the in room. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, Benedict, we can start. Okay, perfect. So let's continue to the second part. Uh, just as a short summary in the first part, um, Sarah presented us um, about how to implement custom recommender system. As you saw, it was super easy to like train um, a DLM model, a DCN model, DLM model, a DCN model, and an uh, XG boost model. So like this feature engineering and model training is like super integrated in Merlin, giving the advantages when you first define your feature engineering pipeline, you can easily try out a lot of models. Then the second part was about how to customize model. Like we are all interested in like building like, like one is like trying out popular Rex architecture, but then maybe we have idea to address specific needs, a specific problem to the data set. And here we learned about how to build like a customized architecture, like combining ideas from DLM, wide and deep and DCM. Now we're going to the next stage, which is like deploying recommender system models. And in the first notebook, we first need to train a model. Um, maybe one note in, um, first is in the end of each notebook, we have like the cell which shuts down the, the kernel, like as we run on 16, I think GPU, um, machines, um, we need to like stop the, uh, the notebook kernel in the end, like free the GPU memory. Otherwise, the memory management doesn't work across multiple notebooks or like environments, which makes sense. So, if anyone has out of memory issues, please um, like restart the kernels or stop the kernels of the previous notebooks that you have the available memory. So, now we're starting with the second part, which is building multi stage recommender systems. Like, first, we came up with an architecture, we found like great accuracy, but we want to deliver value and for delivering value, we need to get them deployed and deploying them is actually more complicated than we sometimes think, specific for recommender system because of multiple pipe uh, steps. Um, Rene mentioned it in the beginning of the presentations, like we see that recommender system have like multiple stages and normally they're like four, which first is a retrieval, which generates some potential candidates normally like the top thousand, but we think they're like great. And this retrieval stage has to be super fast and efficient. Imagine you have like um, 10 millions of users and a hundred thousand items, like calculating with an ex like a more computive, compute intensive model, like each pair is like super expensive. So the retrieval stage provides top candidates for a user. Then we may have a filtering stage, for example, filter out products which are out of stocks, and then scoring, this is what we built um, in the first notebook, it's like a ranking model, is a more complex model, may requires more compute intents 
to like finally score all candidates for a user. And then an ordering stage, which is maybe some business logic that you don't want to have um, all the same like product brands next to each other. You want to may add some diversity into it, or you uh, want to provide a more diverse um, set of lists by like interacting product types or colors. So this is like kind of a reordering stage in the end. And in this um, notebook, we want to train our ranking retrieval model. We are, I actually did it already in the first um, notebook, the ranking models. Um, now we're adding retrieval as well. We want to export them, that we are ready to deploy them. And specific, like providing the files we need for our feature st store registration, which we are using feast for it. And this is like the goal for the second part of it, that we deploy, where we can actually do, like let's say, production-ready uh, requests against it. So let's start. We import our uh, libraries. Just let me. Uh, we import our libraries, and now we're looking at the data uh, or like processing the data. We actually can take a look how the data looks like. This is from the first notebooks. This is actually how our process data would look like. And now we want to look, take only positive items. Like in the second part, we want to use negative sampling is to provide another functionality of the library. And for that, we only focusing on the positive items. So we use MB tabular to filter out um, only the positive one. We call the train fit function, uh, fit uh, and transform functions. And then we have our output saved. Now we start with building our candidate retrieval model for um, model models. Um, why do we need the candidate retrieval? As I mentioned, it's reducing the number of potential, like of all product items to the potential candidates, which could be like a thousand. And so like two reasons. One is we have certain requirements on latency or like throughput and scoring a full product catalog could be just really compute intensive. And the second part is actually we can reduce infrastructure costs because we're using a retrieval model, which is already um, always really fast and quick to compute. Um, we don't need to run like a lot of servers at the same time, calculating or like processing or like do the all the recommendations. And with this like fast first model, we minimize the infrastructure costs. And this is really important. And the idea is we reduce, as I mentioned, the number of potential items to like the top K, um, top K um, candidates, potential candidates, and then we use a second model to, to score them. And here we often have two choices, which are nice, which has like nice properties. One is like a popular choice, like metrics factorization, which uses like only a user embedding and item embedding and a little bit more advanced and like a better accuracy model for candidate generation model is the two tower architecture, which in the end, uses all the user features on one tower and all the item features on the other tower and then feed them through an MLP model and then does the dot product between them. And the advantages is like by using more user features and item features, you have like more accurate model. For example, for user feature next to user ID could be like age, the city, um, yeah, some interest they may fill out. And then the item feature could be like price, categories and so on. So you have like a more informations and the advantage is that the dot product is just like two output vectors, the one output vector of the um, user tower and one output vector of the item tower and do like the dot product like um, element wise multiplication. And there we can use later, we'll see an approximated uh, nearest neighbor search, which retrieves for one user given the top K items and this is, can be really fast computed. A lot of tools and libraries to make that efficient. And this architecture leverage this kind of design that we can use an approximated nearest neighbor search for it. The second part we're using here is negative sampling. We assuming right now we have only positive uh, information, only positive implicit feedback from the user, um, like clicks at to cart purchases. And now we need to learn or like train our um, candidate retrieval. And what we do is in the end, we need to use the negative sampling in item retrieval. So in our library, we provide like in batch negative sampling, like given a batch, it looks for a given user, you have the positive item, then it finds out which other negative items can be added. 
this is a high level summary. Let's look at the code, how that would work. So first, similar to the previous parts, we need to define our uh, data sets, the train and validation data set. And now we select the schema file. We learned about the schema file. And here you see how important the tags are. When we tag before the features correctly, we can build this architectures really easily because it knows what is the item uh, features, what are the user features based on the tags, what are the IDs when we need to do the sampling correctly. And then we remove some features we don't want to use, like the raw IDs we just need later for the deployment steps, maybe the event type and the target. Like we don't want to use the target as an input specific in our negative sampling strategies, important to remove the target. And then we can define our two tower architectures with one command line, which in the end use the schema to determine which features to go where, to initialize the embedding tables with canality correctly, then the query tower, um, which defines the architecture here in the blue box and in the green box. And then finally, like we use an image sampling method. So I calculated, oh. Okay, and then we can compile and just train a model. We can define here ranking matrices. Like right now we're looking at recall at 10, like on the top 10 and NBCG top 10, um, define the batch size and number of epochs. And this is really easily how to train a two tower um, model with only a few lines of code. So this is training now for three epochs. So this will like, probably take like 30 seconds. Um, yeah, and as this trains, like going forward, we would start exporting our architecture, like our model ready that we can deploy it in the next steps. Actually this trains, so we can look at how to continue. When we want to deploy it in the second step, we uh, want to deploy the different uh, parts. So like right now, we want to deploy, like save only the query tower. So in our query tower, this is like in our case, the user, like given a user, we want to find the top items. So what we do is because it's our library is modular structured, we can easily define uh, like get access to the retrieval block and to the query block. And then we select only the sub part of our architecture and save this with uh, a normal function to, um, to disk that we persisted to disk that we can later load them in our retrieval step. So this is trained, this is saved. Now we go to the second part. Now we tr trained our, our first model, the retrieval or calendar generation. Now we want to train our ranking model. For the ranking, we're using the DLM architecture. You're already used to it. We uh, trained it in the first notebook. In the second notebook, we customized it. So you should be super familiar with it right now. So we're looking at the same data set. Um, we again um, select our, so, uh, uh, remove the, the columns from our schema file. And this time we're using uniform negative sampling. It's a, a similar strategy in batch because it's um, a ranking method uh, model. We define it on the data set level. Like each time we generate a batch, we automatically add the negatives. And here we can define the batch size and the number of, um, uh, the batch size and the number of positives uh, no, sorry, the number of negatives per positive. That's the value. Um, first, we can check we have only positive values in our data set. And if we look at the batch uh, data, uh, batch size, we can see we have a batch size of over 132,000, which if you do the maths, we have like a batch size of 2,400. And then we have 64 negatives per positive, and we should come up around this number. So then similar to the previous uh, notebooks, uh, we can define a DLM model with a single line of code where we define the embedding dimensions, our bottom block for continuous features, the top block and our prediction task. Now we're looking at binary accuracy and um, AOC and we can add class rates because we have like a super imbalanced class uh, data set now with the negative 64 to one. So we can, add um, class weights to it and train this model for two epochs now.
to this will train. I will check if there are some questions in the meantime. Okay, there's no question on Zoom. If you have questions uh, in person, uh, I hope Sarah can answer them. Otherwise, I'm happy to look at the chat or like on the Vexus virtual hub afterwards. Um, yeah. So as this is training, we can look a little bit ahead of the notebook, given we're a little bit late <laughs> in this tutorial uh, from time wise. So what we can do too is easily um, validate our model where we define our validation data set with our data loaders and then just call model evaluate similar to uh, different um, um, yeah, similar to um, TensorFlow Keras API. And finally, we can call model.save to save our DLM model to disk that we can deploy it in the second stage. So the next step is we want to set up a feature store. And the feature store is um, like we're using Feast, which is like um, a library, open source library to de um, define a feature store. And the idea is when we have a user ID, like we can send the user ID to our pipeline and then we retrieve all the user features for this user, run it through our network that we get the user embedding out of it. And so we need to define um, some, some uh, data structure and export it. So first we would um, initialize our, like a folder where we want to initialize feast and initialize the feast repo. This will be soon all executed after the training is done. And then we need to um, define some um, use of like how the user feature looks like. We have to export the user features. So first we um, remove previously files if they would be existing, like if you run them twice. And then we use our data set to get all um, user features per user. So what we do is we get the unique rows for a user from the train data, giving the user ID, um, giving the user ID, and we want to have the feature user and time. We can take a look on this as soon as this is executed. So this is now we saved our model. Um, it's creating the the folder and initialize it. So. Now everything is up to now. So you can see now what our user features are. Like right now we're using uh, weekday and TS hour as an approximation. I think the data set had not much user features in it. Um, we, have to, um, we have to convert them. We need a created timestamp for the feature store itself. And ah, here we can look at it again. And now we save that to our local disk where we say feast later to uh, import this data set. The same we do now for the items. So for the items, we extract the item, feed, um, item uh, features based on the item ID, create them, and you can look how the item features look like, and we can store them to get disk as well. The second part is, as I mentioned, we want to do an approximated nearest neighbor search. So what we can do is we can pre-compute all the item embeddings in advance and store them in our um, index or index them. So this is done in the next step. So we use the two tower model and just look at the item embeddings and compute them by um, extracting the item embeddings for it. And you can see now that this are like the output of our item embeddings, um, yeah, calculated with our two tower model. And we can save them to disk as well. So finally, we need to define for our feature store uh, some Python files, which enables to retrieve them, like read them from the parquet file, initialize them and later retrie uh, retrieve them. 
So it's in the end, we have a user feature.py, which defines um, the file source, what is like the, the user ID, how it's called, and then what are like the features, what duration it is. It's like, it's a configuration file for feast. And um, we import here the path of it, which is like the user feature.paquette, which then here added to it. And similarly, we do that for the item features, which defines the, the types, the column names, um, what is like the unique key for it, and so saved it to disk as well. So at this point, we trained a two tower model for candidate generation and a DMM model for final ranking and provided all the artifacts which we need to de deploy to our pipelines, like to load it later in the second stage where we use Triton inference server. In the end, we should not forget to shut down the model, uh, the notebook that be a free hour memory. But you can do in between, you can always call NVIDIA SMI uh, as I shut down the, mo uh, the notebook to not execute it. We can call this, for example, in the beginning of a notebook. And you could see that the GPU memory is freed or like empty. So the second, the, the, set, the last part of the lab is now we actually deploy the model, which means we load them. And the first thing is how complex this pipeline looked like is we can send a user request to Triton server. Triton server is a library from uh, NVIDIA, which enables to deploy machine learning models. That's deep learning models, boosted tree models on GPU, on CPU. It's optimized for throughput or latency. Like it provides a lot of configuration. It's not only for, it supports TensorFlow, it supports PyTorch, it supports custom frameworks. So it's a general framework for deploying machine learning models. And with Merlin and Merlin system, we optimize or provide a framework to deploy to Triton, easily recommend assistance. And as you see the pipeline, it's pretty complex. It's an example of multiple steps. And as an input, we can provide a user ID and then it fetches from the uh, feature store, um, the user features. Then it starts the retrieval model the candidate generation uses a uh, phase. So here it uses the, the query tower and process the user features to get the user embedding. With the user embedding, we can get the top K candidates. For the top K candidates, we get the item features and then we map them back with the original user features. We map them, we unroll the user features that we have like the same number of user features than top K uh, candidates. And then we score it with our DLM model and then we have the final uh, prediction. So you can see that there's like a lot of step involved and by like uh, unrolling or like using only one user ID, we optimize it that we try to avoid multiple calculations or duplicated cal calculations and being like efficient because in production setting, we have like low latency, high throughput often. Yeah. So let's go through the code and uh, deploy it. So first thing is we need to register our feature store. So we defined this like user feature.py and item feature.py. And now we need to um, apply it to feast. The second step that can take a little bit longer, which is creating like going from the offline store to the um, online store, which is called materialize. And there we need like to define a timestamp or like time range, how long these are like valid. And um, first it does for user features and then for the item features, you can see that can take a few time. But this is like the preparation for this first blue box and this um, like third blue box, which are like the feast store. So the second part is as this materialized, like other cells will be executed faster, is uh, provide uh, like uh, setting up the files which is like an index for approximated nearest neighbor. So we load all the item embeddings we generated in the previous notebook and um, index them to have like a fast top K retrieval. So there we like first generate the uh, folders we need, define the paths, and then we load the item embeddings from the packet files and set up the, the index for it. This will generate this other blue box, the nearest neighbor search. Let's see if uh, Fice is 
it's still running. Um, I'm looking at chat in the meantime. I think one question, which is a great question, why do we only need the item ID together with the embedding columns? Like for the two tower model, we, we used all item features, used all item features, fed it through the item tower and get the item embedding. So it's like the embedding representation of based on all item features. And then to calculate the score, of which are like, potential candidates, we only need the item embeddings with the user embeddings to calculate the score. We don't need the other item features anymore. And this is like an efficient way because we pre-process them all. That means for every user request, we don't have to process this network over and over and over again. We just process it once for all items and then we can do the dot product. So I will look um, when we have any end time. And at the end, if you have time, I will look through the remaining questions. But here we materialize it. This should now set up um, our nearest neighbor search. And now we can continue building our pipeline. So this is now. Um, our library modern system, which defines, which helps to define this pipeline. So far, we just set up the external libraries and provided the artifacts, but how to define this pipeline, when to call it, which are the different steps, when to combine them again. And there we can use a similar API than we use in Envitabra, which uses the pipe pipe operator to chain different commands. So first we initialize the feature score. And here we say like, based on the user ID URL, we want to carry feast and get the uh, user features. And this is then like the first um, green box here. Maybe I can open this. Yeah. Um, afterwards, we want to get the, the retrieval model. So first, um, we need to get the retrieval model using the use of features and then predict, the, uh, predict TensorFlow, like use the TensorFlow model from the retrieval tower, like only the user tower, and then carry uh, files with it. These are actually these three, uh, these two steps, like first user fetch, and then we do these two steps. Now we have the top K, um, the top here we define top K is 100, so we got like 100 potential items for a user. Now we want to use the candidate IDs and get the item features back for them. This is now this, the fourth green box querying the blue box. So as a next step, we need to unroll them that we have the same number of user, like, like first we had only one user ID and then we duplicated it a hundred times. This is in the end unrolling. And we add the item features to it. So this would be like the next green box. And then finally, we have this all. And now we want to use the ranking model to predict the final score. This is now this green box. And finally, we say we want to use only the top uh, K, or the top 10 of this one with some hyperparameter like temperature to have a little bit uh, smoother function into it. So, but until now, we just defined this graph. This is like, we defined this graph. We, we initialized the, or we set up the blue boxes, but we just defined the green uh, pipeline so far, but nothing has, has been done. So this is now in the end exporting this ensembling structure to our uh, local disk first. So we need to define the request schema, which is user ID, um, ID raw in the beginning, and then we define our um, folder where we want to export path it. And this, this cell is important. This is actually creating all these artifacts to disk, what we need to do. And here you can inject, this is like our Triton configuration. This would load Triton, which is in the end an ensemble. 
And this ensemble model with uh, config five uses these five steps, uh, six steps, sorry, um, to do the final recommendation. And each of these steps have like either configuration files or here, for example, a TensorFlow model in it, um, providing like the individually steps, but in the end, we ensemble it. So in the end, we want to test this now. Like now um, everything is there and now we want to try it out and how it, that, that would be like the case, how it would look in production. So first we generate an example request based on this user ID. Like we need here user ID, which happened in the test, uh, sorry, in the data set, um, which we convert and do everything. And then finally we call here uh, the Triton server. So this command will spin up Triton, load all the models, and when it's ready, it will send the request to Triton and wants to receive the field or the information the ordered ideas, which are like the item IDs ordered based on the top K. And this will run all these uh, five models, uh, six models in, in, in steps, like in, in our graph. So you can see in between it was already loaded and then it loads finished. Yeah, and now we have here our final recommendations. Um, so this is just an example to provide you in this tutorial. No, normally you can call the Triton server and then this Triton server like is um, running and waiting for requests. Like right now we just started and then directly shut it down. But in a real case scenario, you would um, deploy, like create all these artifacts and then you would start the Triton server and then Triton server loads everything and just waiting for requests. And Triton server can batch multiple requests together, or you can do like one by one requests, or like you have a lot of configuration options. So this is the end of the tutorial. So this was the hands on part. Before you leave, um, important for us is, um, could you fill out the survey? So we are all like, this is now the third time we provided a tutorial at the uh, Rexus conference. And we always like to get feedback. It's for us important to understand um, how you like the tutorial, what elements are important for you or like helpful for deploying recommender systems. And it would be super helpful for us to understand um, how you liked it, what can you provide as a feedback, what we might should improve the next time. And it would be really, uh, yeah, we would highly appreciate it to get the honest feedback around it. To summarize, um, our tutorial is like, if we're going back in our agenda, we started with like providing a explanation high level about Merlin and uh, Merlin framework, focus on ME tabla for feature engineering, Merlin models for training models and Merlin system to deploying them on a Triton inference server. In the hands-on part, we have, uh, we started with like training popular access architectures like DL DLRM, DCN and XGBoost. Um, Merlin models supports other models as well like implicit or light FM. So it's not limited only to rec uh, deep learning architectures. The advantage is as the feature engineering and model training are super integrated, you can train and exchange even like these uh, non-deep uh, non learning uh, models and deep learning models really easy with each other. We were looking for session-based support um, soon. Then in the second part, we looked at customizing, building your own architecture. So that way you can address specific problems at your data set or trying out research ideas with modern models using existing popular model blocks, maybe combining them or adding uh, own ones. And then in the second part in section three and four, we looked at how to deploy a pipeline of six steps efficient using a feature store, uh, candidate um, the generation process using an A and N search, and finally re rank them with a DLM model. So um, some final parts. Um, our, um, some resources like we like on, uh, on GitHub, it's an open source project. So we have a lot of examples in our repositories explaining like we have like, I think another probably even 20 notebooks there, um, which gives you more detailed information about all these different steps. 
And we like an open source project. So if you have any questions or issues or feature requests, we are looking or like we are appreciating all your feedback. We look at them, monitor them, answer them, add them to our roadmap. So feel free to file um, issues on our GitHub repositories. Otherwise, I can recommend some of our blog posts explaining um, yeah, different concepts from like the four stage recommender model to like um, exploring different recommender systems with Merlin. Um, we are actively working always at the Rexus challenges uh, from this conference or like other things. And yeah, we have the blog post around it or code available using our library. So feel free to check out our resources. And yeah, finally, yeah, um, about some questions. We will upload the slides as a PDF to the GitHub repository. Um, let me just pull this up. So we have here our GitHub repository containing um, the notebooks. We will add the uh, this presentation slides as a PDF there, and we will provide a Docker file um, to easily start the container and deploy it yourself. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I hope you enjoyed it and um, thank you all for joining. Um, please fill out the survey. And I don't know even if you're there, if you want to have some closing remarks. Yes, thank you, Benedict. I'll hand it over to Ivan to just give an overview of the Marine framework and close the discuss session. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Um, and thank you, especially to, to Sarah, Renai, and Benedict for putting together this tutorial. So Merlin is our open source framework for you know, training, building, deploying recommender systems. We've built this system based on our experiences building recommender systems ourselves, really trying to solve some of the challenges. So some of the challenges you know, include training time and we're trying to accelerate that through GPU. But you know, personally, I found some of the challenges to be things like you know, the iteration between feature engineering and training. And that's, that's a, just such a common step that we've tried to do things that optimize that step to make your life easier as a data scientist, as a machine learning engineer, to be able to go through and just step between those two much more quickly and efficiently instead of having to constantly change the model. We can, you know, as we process the data, capture all the information needed to create those first layers of the model. So that's sort of the, the impetus behind Merlin, what we're building. And we've tried to extend that and carry that on. We're now exploring, like, how do you deploy models into production more easily? How do you, you know, take, as a, as a machine learning engineer, you may be working on either side of the equation, maybe, you know, maybe doing all, all of this. Um, or you may be sort of in the situation where you're receiving models from a team. If that team is providing, you know, those models with an artifact that makes it really straightforward and clear to deploy to production, we're hoping that makes your life easier as well. And, and we're also exploring MLOps. So, you know, we're really trying to, to make the Rexus space easier. Um, I think we've tried to make the, the, the libraries as flexible as possible. This is open source. You know, we are a, a, a relatively small team focused on building this and we certainly welcome contributions. Um, if you have any questions about Merlin, if you're interested, uh, Sarah, myself, and, and Ben, who's at the back, uh, are, are at the conference. Uh, we also have one of the experts at one of the core libraries, Matthias, who's sort of uh, part of HubeCTR, and, and, and we have a paper at the conference as well on the, the parameter server that's, that's incorporated into that project. So you know, we're, we're super excited to be here and supporting the Rexus space and trying to build open source software that makes it easier for people to build and train and deploy recommender systems into production. So, you know, if that's something that you do, it's part of your role, uh, we'd love to talk to you and, and catch up and understand like, what are your core problems? What are the things you're challenged with? What are the tools you're using? So we can make sure that we're integrating those into our system. So, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and, and be sure to check up the GitHub repo and, you know, uh, it's it's all available for download. It's all free. It's all it's all there. <laughs>